You probably know the story of the man with the game leg, game in the sense of having pulled a muscle or pulled a ligament. He found that it was a very good excuse for getting out of work. Can't do that, I've got a game leg, he would say. And so even as the leg was getting better, he continued to walk as if the leg were still game to get out of work. And in the end, he really did damage the leg. So as you look at your practice, what is your game leg? The unskillful thoughts, attitudes, the excuses you give to yourself for not putting more effort into the practice. Because a lot of the practice is simply learn how to drop the excuses and just do it. I think it was a John Sing Tong who once said that there's nothing mysterious about the practice. It's simply a matter of just doing it. And when the path finally comes together, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's all the factors you knew about. There's no secret esoteric teaching. But it's simply getting everything together right. Just like your body walking. How can you get everything together? So you walk without a limp. And get to where you want to go. There are four teachings, the Buddha said, that can't be argued with, that form the basis of the practice, that you know that if you're following these teachings, you're on, on course. And they're all very basic. I met a monk one time in Thailand who had said he'd found it difficult to live with any of John's. He knew that this was his habit. As soon as he lived with somebody, he'd start getting into trouble, so he had to go off and live on his own. And so he'd asked Ajahn Mahabhua what teachings he should hold to as he was living on his own to make sure he didn't go off course. Mm -hmm. This was the teaching Ajahn Mahabhua gave, these four qualities that the Buddha had set out. One is sticking to your precepts. Two is learning how to hold restraint over your senses. Each time you look at something, each time you listen, smell, taste, touch, think about something, ask yourself, why? Which member of the committee is doing the looking? The greed member? The anger member? Or the simple observer? If you see there's any greed involved in your motivation for looking, don't look. And also look at what's happening as a result. In other words, you're looking at your engagement with the senses as part of a cause and effect process. What's motivating your contact, or motivating your desire to go out and look and listen? And what happens to the mind as a result? If you find that you're aggravating your greed or aggravating your lust or delusion, you can learn how to look in different ways. And this is one of the reasons why we have the contemplation of the body. So if you see something beautiful, look beneath the skin. You look at yourself, you think you're okay. You may not be especially good looking, but you decide you're okay. You're... But if you take off the skin, you can be able to look at yourself. The Buddha has you do this analysis with yourself first, to, to be fair. And also to deal with the fact that our attraction to the human body starts with our own attraction to our own bodies. So learn how to look at these things in a different way. Instead of looking for the signs of beauty, look for the signs of aging, look for the signs of decay. Or as John Lee says, turn your eyes around. If all you can see is something that inspires lust, well, turn your eyes around so that you can see something that inspires a sense of loathing. If all you can see are things that inspire disgust, okay, turn your eyes around to realize that it's this process of perception, the labels we give to things, 
which, as a John Sawat pointed out one time, are little agreements in the mind. This means that. That means this. This is something you stamp with like. This is something you stamp with dislike. Well, learn how to question those agreements. These little pacts the mind has with itself. So that you're looking and listening. At the very least, don't damage the state of the mind. and actually can become part of the practice. Moderation in eating. How much do you need? When you fill up your bowl, fill up your plate, are you taking just enough? You're taking just a little bit extra just in case. And John Cha's rule was that if he could feel that within five mouthfuls he was going to be full, he would stop and then he'd fill himself up with water. That would be it. But most of us are not like that. We're full and then we top it off with another five mouthfuls. At least. So learn how to read your body's needs. And remember, the food that you don't eat can be a gift. If you're a monk, it can be a gift to the monks down the line. If you're a layperson, it can be a gift to the other lay people. And finally, being wakeful. Trying to get by with as little sleep as possible. Now, there are no hard and fast rules here. The standard in the canon is four hours of sleep a day. But you have to look at yourself. How much sleep is enough, and at one point is it getting to be too much? And as for the time you're awake, try to spend it as much as you can with the sitting and walking meditation. We've got our duties, we've got our chores around the monastery. But there's a lot of time left over that we could be spent in sitting and walking in, as the Buddha says, cleansing away unskillful qualities in the mind. In other words, working primarily on the big sense door, which is the sense door of the mind. There's that story of the novice who taught the, the scholar. His meditation instructions were simple. And this is a termite nest with six holes. And in the Thai version, there's a chamot and a civet cat inside the termites, termites nest. And you want to catch it. So what do you do? You close off five of the holes and you stay watching just the one. In other words, you keep watch over the mind. As you sit, as you walk, as you stand, as you go through all your activities in the day. And if you see anything that comes up, and especially the game leg parts of the mind, the excuse, well, I can't do it all that much, or I've got this problem today, i got that problem today, learn how to cleanse your mind of those things, because they are defilements. This is a concept we don't like to hear about much in the West. People either pretend that it's not there or that the Buddha said these things don't really exist, they don't matter. But the mind, compared to an awakened mind, your mind is dirty. Not in the sense of a dirty old man mind, but simply there's the dirt of greed, there's the dirt of aversion, there's the dirt of delusion. It's clouding things up, obscuring what you could see if you would take the time. So these instructions are pretty basic. But as is often the case, we tend to think we're too good for the basics and we want to move on to the next level. But it turns out that doing the basics really, really well is what makes all the difference, because that's where you catch yourself making excuses for your game leg. So focus on getting the basics right, and everything else will fall in line.